Rahu and Ketu don't have the typical Avastas. They don't have Jagradati Avastas. They don't have the Baladi Avastas. They don't have Diptadi Avastas. And they don't have Lajitadi Avastas. And they don't have those things because they don't have dignities. They don't have friends. They don't have enemies. They don't have any of that stuff. The only Avastas that Rahu and Ketu have are the Shayanadi Avastas. And so they're really a completely different breed of planet. We can't judge um, Rahu and Ketu the same way as we do other planets. A lot of astrologers attempt that. They try to assign dignities to Rahu and Ketu, exaltations, even rulerships to Rahu and Ketu. And some of the more mediocre classical texts try to get into that. But None of it works, and they're all in contradiction. One chart will say, you know, Rahu's exalted in Taurus, another one will say Gemini, another one will say Virgo. You know, there's, it's all this mix and match. They do not have dignities, because they're simply not planets. Okay, what are they? Well, we've got the Earth here. And the Sun travels around the Earth. Okay? And so that's where the Sun travels, that's the ecliptic. Then the moon travels around the earth too. Now I'm going to draw this little extreme so it looks right on the drawing, but the moon travels around the earth and it goes around the path of the ecliptic. But the moon's path is actually inclined at about five degrees to the path of the ecliptic. So this is the ecliptic path. Okay? The moon's path is at five degrees. So the moon's kind of traveling around the earth like this. Okay? So that means, occasionally, the moon will cross the path of the ecliptic. So the sun's making a path around the earth, a circle, like a plane. Then the moon's going around the earth and making a plane. And where those two planes intersect are Rahu and Ketu. They're simply the intersection of the plane of the earth, of the moon traveling around the earth, with that of the sun traveling around the earth. And of course we know the earth travels around the sun, but from where we see it, it looks like the sun is going around. So I'm doing it from our point of view, not the solar point of view. And in that way, Rahu and Ketu are actually a lot more similar to a Baba cusp than they are to a planet. Okay? Rahu and Ketu only exist twice a month. They exist when the moon crosses the equator on its, as it goes north, which is the Rahu point, and it exists when the moon crosses the sun's equator as it goes south, okay, or crosses the, the sun, you know, the ecliptic as it moves south, and that's the south node, or K2, okay? Um, I can draw this a little better. I want to do a little better visual here, okay? Here's Earth. Okay, moon is traveling around earth in this plane. Sun travels around the earth in this plane. These are circles, okay? Around earth, around earth, okay? And right here, the sun, the moon, say, is moving north. It's going around this circle and it crosses the plane of the zodiac, of the ecliptic, and that's Rahu. Then the moon goes up and then it goes down and it crosses the plane of the zodiac, again, and that is K2 as it's moving south. Okay? It's kind of hard to see, you got to imagine a little bit. So, that's exactly a similar thing that Bhavas are. What are Bhavas? Well, Bhavas, or like especially the log and seventh house cusp, is the intersection of the um, horizon so the, hor hor the horizon plane, so when you look out, you see this plane, this disk, and that's the horizon. You look around, you turn around, and you'll see this disk of the horizon. That's the horizon plane. And then, moving through the horizon plane is the ecliptic, the zodiac. And on the east side where that hor horizon plane intersects the ecliptic is the lagna. And on the west side where it intersects is the seventh house. So the First and seventh house, and really all Bhavas, are just intersections of the ecliptic with different planes. Okay? The same way that Rahu and Ketu are the intersection of the plane of the moon going around the earth 
without of the sun going around the earth. There are simply intersections of planes. Okay? So, they're not actually planets. And Vedic astrology doesn't call them planets. They're not ketas, they're not planets, they're not bodies flying in the sky. They're what we call grahas. And what are grahas? Grahas are something that sees our consciousness and put us into a state of being that guarantees that we have a karmic consequence. Okay? It makes you, you know, really it sees your mind and puts your mind in a place so that you burn the fruits of your karmas. They make you fall in love with the person that you're meant to burn your karma with. They make you want the job that you're meant to work at, and so on. They seize your mind. They seize our minds. They're called seizures, or, you know, like they grab it and make our minds think and see things a certain way so that our karma comes to us. As a result of being grahas, that Rahu and Ketu have Shainadi Abhashtas. The Shainadi Abhashtas have to do with how a planet is um, seizing our mind. Or how something is seized in our mind. Anything that sees our mind has to have a Shainadi Vashta because the Shainadi Vashta shows how something seizes our mind. And we'll get into those later. Okay? But the other Vashtas have to do with the planets, with the, what we call the Ketas. The things that are actually moving around in the heavens, that are actually there. Um, the Sun through Saturn, the true planets. Those are aspects of consciousness. Okay? Those are things that um, cause us to make choices and have certain behaviors. And we go about making those choices either successfully or unsuccessfully. We have a planet that we make good choices with because we're focused on it. We have a goal with that. And we're disciplined with it, focused with it, inspired with it. And so we have success with it at the expense of other things. Okay, we can't have success with everything at once, right? We can't make a billion dollars while we're studying astrology, while we're trying to be enlightened, while we're trying to become a gold medalist at the Olympics, right? Can't do it, okay? We only can do one thing great at a time. And the other question is, let us see what we're trying to focus on. You know, we're trying to make the most of a planet. Is that planet getting supported by friends? Which means, are we really focused on making that happen? Or is that planet disturbed by enemies, so we're letting other things get in the way of the success of that planet because we're also trying to do other things. In which case we have no peace, only starvation, only dissatisfaction. And those are the bad Lajitadi Abhashtas. Sri Yukteswar says in his Holy Science that the soul is meant to incarnate and through the agency of the five elements, focus on something, enjoy the fruits of the success of that something, find peace and happiness and fulfillment, and then naturally return back to spirit. But he said instead what happens is, the soul comes down here, incarnates, it has so many desires, so many things it wants to do, that it never focuses on any one single thing to a high point of success. As a result, it never has fulfillment in anything. Okay? And the people who have the best lives, if you ask them, it's because they focused on one thing with full inspiration and full creativity and they accomplished one other thing that made all the sacrifices of being on life on earth worthwhile. We're going to make sacrifices whether we reap a great fruit or not. Okay? We're going to make sacrifices in life. So even people who don't reap a great success because they're not focused, because they have bad lachitati of ashtas, they're going to make sacrifices, not have happiness in certain things, but they're not going to have anything that made it really worthwhile to be here, that made, it, that made them have a peacefulness and a contentment of heart. So what do they do instead? Well, they get into addictions and drinking and just trying to escape and get away the whole time. That's what bad Lajitadi Abhashtas do. Okay? So the good Lajitadi Abhashtas are the planets that Sri Yukteswar is basically talking about. That makes us focus on something to a point of success, and fulfilling that success, we find a state of happiness. The planets that are, have a lot of poor Lajitadi Abhashtas floating around on them are planets that we focus on only with distraction and incompletely, 
And so we have no fulfillment from those planets, and they become damaging things in our lives. They don't become supportive to our lives. So, it's those other planets, Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn, that determine all those choices that we're making. I need this, and I want this. Can I have them together? If so, yes, great. Can I not have them together? Which will I sacrifice? I'm not willing to sacrifice either then I won't get anywhere. That's what all the Lajitati Vashas are doing. Which we've talked about in depth. But Rahu and Ketu don't represent those choices. All the other planets represent those choices. And these are all choices that we make within ourselves. We actually make these choices every day. We're like, geez, I'd rather have this than that, so I'm sacrificing that. And we don't always make those with our clear consciousness where we understand it on paper. But we really self-examine ourselves, we'll see why we've made the choices to make our life exactly the way it is, with all the loneliness in it, with all the lack in it, because we didn't want to do the thing that would give that fulfillment, because we were busy doing something else. Hopefully well, so the sacrifice is worth it, but so often poorly, so the sacrifice was not worth it, and so we're really unhappy, and we feel like we have nothing in our lives. But those are choices we make. And while we're making those choices, if we do self-examination and we see how we're really making our lives unfold in accordance with our Lajitati indicated choices, we can make some different choices. We can say, oh, you know, okay, I see how this choice is creating this. Okay? So all those planets are creating these choices that we make to choose to do an action. So we choose to do something, we choose to perform some action. And while we're choosing to perform that action, we can always choose to perform some other actions too. Okay? If we take the time for self-introspection to see what's really going on. But once the action is taken, there's nothing we can do about it. Once we take an action, there's going to be an effect of that action. Okay, so for instance, if, we, if it's Halloween and we eat five pounds of chocolate, because it was Halloween yesterday, I didn't have a single piece this year, but if someone, if someone had eaten five pounds of chocolate, the minute they swallow that chocolate, the minute they complete eating that chocolate, five pounds of it, there's a repercussion to that action, that there's no escaping. There's nothing they can do at that point to escape the repercussion of that action. And it's like that in everything we do. Every action we take, once it's taken, creates a chain of events that's going to recreate a repercussion in our lives. And there are certain places in the horoscope where those repercussions are going to be focalized. Okay? Well, those repercussions are going to be beyond choice, where they're not going to have choice, where they're going to be faded things that seem to come out of the blue and unexpectedly, perhaps unfairly, because we don't feel like we're choosing those things. And those are the truly faded things. And those are the things that Rahu and K2 are. Okay? They're the truly faded things in our horoscopes. Okay? But they're faded for a reason. Okay? Well, they're faded so we can understand and come to terms with who we really are, develop our emotions, our psychology, and our spirit, which is the sun and moon. Because Rahu and Ketu are the intersections of the sun's and moon's paths as they travel around the earth. So where those two paths meet is where we're going to discover who we really are. And that's why essentially Rahu and Ketu is the most important thing to study in the chart. Because it represents the path of the growth of our consciousness towards spirit. Okay? And that path is full of events that are the result of all of our other actions. Because all of our actions are instigated by the sun and the moon. Okay? The sun is Atma. Okay? Which is the quality that attracts us towards spirit or the truth. Okay? The moon is Manas. 
which is the quality that attracts us to matter. Through the nervous system, the manas, which is hooked to the nervous system, experiences this world, all of which is an illusion, all of which is false and not true. Okay? So through manas, we experience the world. Through atma, the sun, we experience the truth. Everything we do in life is because of the desire to experience the manas, the world, or the desired experience through our Atma, which is the truth. Okay? And the path we take to experience that is Rahu and Ketu. Okay? Because it's the intersection of the Sun and Moon. So as we travel the road of Rahu and Ketu, we're trying to find that balance point between truth and life. Okay? Between what is and what isn't. All right? That's why Ketu is the significator of liberation, of, of full spiritual truth, whereas Rahu is the significator of the worldly task we have no choice but to involve ourselves in. Rahu represents the earthly stuff we need to experience in order to arrive at, a tru at, at the truth of what things really are. So there's no escaping Rahu, and we shouldn't avoid Rahu. We can't, anyway. Okay? So, that path of Rahu and Ketu, or excuse me, everything we do is a result of our sun and moon force. The sun is the force that's inspiring toward truth, and the moon is the force that's inspired towards fulfillment on earth. Okay, fulfillment through the senses, fulfillment of the ego. Every action we make, every choice we make, with all the other planets, including the sun and moon, with all the planets that can have Lajitadi Vashtas, we make because of our sun and moons, because of the needs of the sun and moon. We make the choice because we need to be inspired, which is the sun. We, need, we make the choice because we need to understand the truth, which is the sun. Okay? The Atma Force. Because if we make the choice because of who we truly are, as a unique spark of God. Or, we make a choice because of what our ego wants to experience on earth through the agency of the manas and the five elements which give form to everything. Okay? Every action we take is instigated by these two forces. Okay? And Rahu and Ketu are the intersections of these two forces. Now we start seeing how heavy Rahu and Ketu are. And they're indescribable. I still can't tell you exactly what Rahu and Ketu are. Okay? I can only describe what they are in the context of what their formers are, which are the Sun and Moon. We can't label perfectly Rahu and Ketu. Because it's a path, it's a narrow path marked by single points across the zodiac. It's an unalterable path. As a path that means something different for everybody. Because it's the path of what, of where they're finding that balance between truth and life on earth. Between K2, which is the truth, ultimately liberation, and life on earth, which is Rahu. Okay? Between the Atma force, which is pulling us towards truth, and the Manas force, which is pulling us towards matter. And that's different for everybody, but every choice we make is instigated by the sun and moon. And all those choices are reflective of the Lajitadi Abhashtas. Okay? And where all those choices come to a focal point of the path that our consciousness has to take to realize the truth of the sun and the moon, the truth of spirit and ego are Rahu and Ketu. Okay? So they are essentially focal points of the actions of all the other planets. And all those other planets' actions are instigated by these two needs, the need of the sun and the need of the moon. The other planets have no needs. In the kingdom, the, the king and queen rule. Only things that happen is what they say happen. All the other planets serve the king and queen. Okay? 
All the other planets are making their choices, doing their actions because of instigations of the sun and moon within our charts. And those actions are going to come together into a focal point of learning and realizing the truth of the soul and the truth of the ego. And that journey, that path, and that focal point of all those karmas, of all those other planets, are Rahu and Ketu. That's what Rahu and Ketu are. As a result, they're going to be different for everybody, because everyone's making extremely different choices. Okay? They're all making choices for the same reasons, because of these two forces. But they're all making completely different choices. Okay? Alright, so now that we know what Rahu and Ketu are, the question is, how do we study them? Well, first of all, this path of Rahu and Ketu is indicated by the Baba cusp that Rahu and Ketu join. So the cusps that they join. And the Rashi that they are placed in. Okay? The Manas, the moon, is more to enjoin the cusp. Why? Because the cusp of the Baba is the concrete existing thing. And the Manas, the moon, wants to enjoy and experience that concrete existing thing. Okay? The Rashi is indicative more of the sun. Because first, it's a sun sign, right? Okay, Rashi is a solar sign. But also because the Rashis are the body of Vishnu. It's the unconscious body of Vishnu. And the sun brings life to that part of Vishnu. And even though it's the unconscious body of Vishnu, it symbolizes a nature of Vishnu. Okay? So Pisces, for instance, is the feet of the Vishnu's body, which represents the understanding of Vishnu, okay, as available to life on earth. Therefore, Pisces is the sign of liberation. Okay? The sign, the environment in which liberation can be found. So if we're touching Vishnu's feet through Pisces and dwelling there, we can have the understanding of liberation more effectively than any other sign. Okay? So, the cusp are more what the moon is seeking. And the Rashi is more what the soul, the sun, is seeking. And we know that the sun comes before the moon, right? Okay? The moonlight is reflection of the sunlight. As a result, how well we can manage the cusps and make the cusp work out positively for us depends on how well we manage and come to terms with the nature of the sign that Rahu or Ketu is in. So when someone goes into Rahu and Ketu Dasha, we have a rule, for instance, that Rahu Rahu destroys the Bhava it's in. Okay, so if you have Rahu in the second house, it's going to destroy your wealth, family, and friendship. The first thing Rahu does, because Rahu hates the moon, is Rahu destroys what's most important to the moon, which are the Bhava cusps. But the whole foundation for those Bhava cusps to have any realization is in the Rashi. So the person to make those Bhavas work has to develop the quality of the Rashi that Rahu's in, which I've talked about in the Mastering Rahu and Ketu sign. A person needs to focus on developing that Rashi quality. And the degree to which the person can develop that Rashi quality, which is all that's left after the Bhava gets destroyed, determines how well a person can redevelop those Bhavas as Rahu Dasha continues. Okay? Alright. Now, K2 on the other hand, is a significator of liberation. He represents the nature of the um, sun, or the nature of the sun more. He particularly likes to swallow the sun. So, in K2, 
is more inclined to take away the nature of the Rashi it's found in. And through that being taken away, through that something missing, creating this great discontentment that makes us want to see the Divine in daily life. Meaning right in front of us on earth in daily life. And it'll see that as the Baba cusp that K2 is conjunct. All right? So if you have K2 in the seventh house, you can come to terms with seeing God as manifesting as your spouse. If you have K2 in the fourth house, you'll come to see God's first manifestation of God will be God as your um, as your as your feelings, as your heart. You'll find God in your heart. Okay. If you have K2 in the third house, you'll find God as will. You'll see God as active will in this world. Paramahansa Yogananda had God in the, he had K2 in the third house. And his teachings are so marked about active will, that God is our will. Use your willpower. He wasn't into astrology, because astrology is against willpower. He was very much into free will and using our wills. Because he saw God as will, because K2 is in the third cusp, conjunct the third cusp. So, um, so K2 and Rahu work somewhat differently. So with K2, we have to learn to see the divine in the cusp because we're feeling the discontentment of the sign. With Rahu, the cusp gets destroyed and we have to develop the Rashi in order to have any success with the cusp as Rahu Dasha progresses. Okay? All right, I'll probably talk about that more at some other point. But now the question is, when it comes down to this course and the Lajitadya Bhashtas, what are, how do we determine how good those Rahu and Ketu are going to do? I mean, how good are they? They're karmic forces. They're karmic forces that are beyond a person's control because they're the focal points of all the other karma which has already been taken via the other planets. We've already chosen those actions. We've already done those things, and now the repercussions will fall through Rahu and Ketu by putting us in different situations to learn the lessons of Rahu and Ketu, whether we want to learn them or not. What determines that are the influences of all the planets to Rahu and Ketu, because they're the focal points of Rahu and Ketu. Got it? Okay? So, what planets influence Rahu and Ketu? Well, the planets that influence Rahu and Ketu are the Lord of the sign. So on the Rashi chart, Rahu may be in Pisces. In the Hora chart, it might be in Virgo. So that means in the Hora chart, Mercury is influencing Rahu. In the Rashi chart, Jupiter is influencing Rahu. Okay? So, the Lord of the sign that Rahu and Ketu falls in, in every Varga, is influencing Rahu or Ketu, as the case may be. Okay? The second thing that can influence it is the planet conjunct Rahu and Ketu. The planet conjunct Rahu or Ketu in the Rashi chart is going to influence Rahu and Ketu in all the Varga charts, because they're next to each other. Okay? Then the planet that aspects Rahu and Ketu will influence Rahu and Ketu. And again, we take the aspects in the Rashi chart and then look at those and then to take care of those aspects over to all the Varga charts. So if Jupiter aspects Rahu, Jupiter is influencing Rahu in all the Varga charts. Okay? So these, all these planets are going to influence Rahu or Ketu in a good or bad way. The planet will influence it in a good way if it's in a positive Lajitadya Vastra. It'll influence it in a bad way if it's in a negative Lajitadya. So if the Sun is in a negative Lajitadya Vastra and influences K2, K2 is going to behave in a problematical way. Because the sun represents inadequate actions, improper actions, unsupportive actions, 
that are now having a karmic realization through K2, which means K2, all those karmic forces of the sun are going to manifest through K2 and cause K2 to ruin the bhava that's in it. Okay? It'll cause K2 to ruin the bhava it's in. If, on the other hand, and you need to look at all the planets influencing Rahu and K2. Okay? And if there's any poor Lajitati of Ashta planet, those, those planets will hurt the Baba cusp that Rahu and K2 join. And they'll hurt the Rashi qualities that Rahu and K2 are in, of which Rahu and K2 are in. If it's good Lajitati of Ashta planets influencing it, who have more, you know, who are overall good Lajitati of Ashta planets, then Rahu and K2's Babas will flourish and it'll go well. Okay? So, the way we determine whether Rahu and K2 are going to be productive or disruptive is by examining the, the Lajitati of Ashtas of all the planets that are influencing them. Okay? Pretty simple, right? Because they're simply given the results of all those actions and, and um, choices indicated by all the other planets. So essentially, we're actually judging Rahu and K2 just as a Bhavakas, the same way. We looked at a Bhavakas and we looked at the Lajitati influences to it, and we decided the Bhava would do better or worse. We do the same with Rahu and K2. If you're Rahu, which is always the scary Dasha, we're always so scared of Rahu Dasha. Why? Well, because Rahu always brings us into new unknown things, which is stressful. And if those new unknown things also are difficult, it's really painful. We don't talk about K2 as much. We don't freak out, oh, K2 Dasha is coming. Why? Well, because K2 represents things we can manage more easily. We're more adept at those things to begin with. So when K2 things start falling apart, we just deal with it better. And we're like, well, I was sort of sick of that anyway. Okay, so we manage it from a place of strength. With Rahu, we manage things from a point of weakness. And so it's way more worse. So for instance, if you work at a hospital and you get cut at the hospital, you're not going to really stress about it, right? Because you're in the hospital, you know how to take care of cuts. You're going to take care of the cut and fine. But... If you um, were raised by a really protective mother and then got into a, you know, got lost in the woods one day and fell and cut your finger and you were out there and not sure where you are, you'd be freaking out. Oh no, I'm, what if I lose my finger? Well, that's the difference between Rahu and K2. Rahu is in a new environment with new things, so the slightest things going wrong creates a lot of fear and a lot of worries because it's not a familiar thing. It's an unfamiliar environment, unfamiliar environment, and an unfamiliar thing. K2 is a familiar environment and a familiar thing. So it's like, it's not that big a deal. Okay? So, um, when we judge Rahu, and it's easy to get scared of Rahu Dasha, you want to simply see what Rahu's doing Lajitani-wise. I went to my Rahu Dasha recently, and it's in the seventh house. An angle. Rahu and Ketu and angles are always going to be more important in a person's life than in other Bhavas, usually. Unless they're joined with the sun or moon, which always makes them really important. In fact, to have sort of a rule. Rahu and Ketu and angles create a more Rahu Ketu personality, or Rahu and Ketu conjunct the sun or moon. If any of those things happen, Rahu is like a bigger emphasis in the person's makeup and life. So I was going into Rahu Dasha, and it's in the seventh. I was worried, of course, because it's Rahu, like everyone, ooh, 18 years of Rahu. But in the most important Varga, relevant to the seventh house, which is the Saptamsha, Rahu only has influences from perfect Lajitani planets. Like, wow. So the last year of Rahu Dasha has been surprisingly a great Rahu Dasha. It's the there's no poor Lajitati influences to it at all. The planets in that Varga that have bad Lajitati Avashtas are not influencing Rahu and Ketu. They're not aspecting it. They're not influencing it. So Rahu has given me a great ride. Now in other Vargas, that won't necessarily be the case. But in the most important Varga of Rahu, it is in good shape. In the most important Varga. So, when you see Rahu and Ketu, see the house they're in. 
Look at the most important barga relevant to that house. Okay? And that most important varga, if Rahu and Ketu is doing really good there, you can expect a pretty good Rahu Dasha or Ketu Dasha. And sure, there'll be some other vargas where it's bad, where there will be problems. But at least the most important thing about Rahu and Ketu will be good. Okay? Then, um, and so do the same for Ketu. Okay, check that critical pertinent Baba. If that planet, Rahu or Ketu, is influenced only by bad Lajitadi Avashta planets in the most important Varga relevant to the house that Rahu and Ketu is in, then that's the Rahu and Ketu Dasha you do not want. <laughs> okay? And then, of course, always examine Rahu and Ketu in the 40th, 45th, and 60th to see the influences upon Rahu and K2 and see if they're really going to be as good or bad as indicated in the Varga. If the Varga is indicating really good and the 40th Varga also indicates great, they're going to be a really, really lucky Rahu Dasha. But if the 40th Varga is indicating lots of trouble, it's really not going to be as good as that other Varga, the pertinent Varga made it look. Same for the 45th and 60th. So look in those Vargas too. And then you'll have an idea of, in general, if they're going to have a good or bad Rahu Dasha. Okay? And then you can get to minutely breaking it down in accordance with all the other Vargas and so on. Okay? Um, and, you know, predict all the other things. But that's sort of the most important thing to look at. If that part's good, and Rahu and Ketu ruin a lot of other things, and they will ruin some things, and still, at least the person will still have that good, solid anchor in their life to continue on. Okay? So that's how we're going to look at Ra, Rahu and K2 with respect to these Lajitani Avashtas. In the next video, um, I'll be looking at some examples to show how we can look at these, um, how we actually look at them in charts. Okay, thank you.